Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Avanti Insights. And we're here with Daniel Spicer, our Chief Security Officer. And Daniel, I've got some news for you. You ready? I'm ready. Uh, okay, <laughs> there we go. All right. So, Daniel, this is our 20th episode. I know there's podcasts out there with hundreds, if not thousands of episodes, but hey, 20, it's a nice little milestone. I think it's reason to celebrate. Absolutely. And you know what? As we wind down the year, this is our last podcast of 2021, but what better way to close it out than to talk about some cybersecurity myths. So here, Daniel, we may refer to you today as the myth buster. So let's start with the first one passwords. Hey, you know what, boy, ideally we'd have biometrics and other kinds of authentication and not have to worry about passwords in an ideal world, but they're still a necessary evil right now. And there's really no running away, at least, you know, in the, in the near future. So myth number one, here's the question for you. Passwords should be changed every 30 days. Your thoughts on this? On the surface, it may make sense to be constantly changing passwords and and having users change their passwords as, as often as possible. Uh, but there's a lot of risk that comes with that. The most common one is users tend to make bad passwords, right? They'll, they'll make things that are, are easy to crack or there are iterations on the password. You know, the, the old common uh, jokes about changing the one to a two or changing 21 to, to 22 as it kind of is with the end of the year. That makes them really susceptible to password spraying attacks. What's really important here is, is users create strong passwords that are unique for each of their accounts and making passwords that are, are difficult to crack, that aren't susceptible to, again, password spraying attacks or, you know, uh, a dictionary substitution attacks. One of the things that we always recommend is password managers, right? For, for home and individual users, use a password manager that helps create those really strong passwords. If that's not really an option or you're thinking about your, your active directory, long passwords with shorter change times um, or, or long passwords without even complexity is typically going to present a better password that has more entropy that's harder to brute force and guess. I like to refer to, to NIST 863B in these scenarios. It really talks about what a strong password can be. Now on the enterprise side, I always tell people start looking at SSO. If you're not already using single sign-on and you're not being aggressive and, and uh, only using applications that have SSO, definitely be doing that. And then after that, start thinking about passwordless authentication. Okay. For uh, the next top one, let's continue with the theme of passwords. Myth number two. Mr. Daniel Spicer, our MythBuster today, do not write down your passwords. Yeah, so obviously you don't want to have your password um, written down in a place where where everyone can see it, like a, on a cubicle in a shared space. But forgetting your password in, in a lot of scenarios is worse, especially when it's related to encryption, right? So if you forget that password, theoretically, there's no way to getting around that encryption ever again. And so having, having a way to back that up is really important. You know, storing passwords on a, on a Word document, storing passwords on an office cubicle, probably not the best idea. But trying to put passwords in a, a password manager or um, in some kind of, of shared vault is always very positive. Uh, and, and along with that, make sure your vault is backed up. You never want to be in a scenario where all the, the critical passwords for encryption, the encryption keys, your, your network device um, root passwords are lost because of some kind of hardware failure um, or worst case scenario, ransomware. So always, always try to put these into a vault that you have access to and always make sure that you have that in an offline backup as well. And let me ask you this, Daniel, just uh, so for an old style guy like me, where maybe I don't have a vault and, you know, some of the things that you're talking about here, if I'm writing it down, just like in a journal, like physically writing it down at my desk, it's kind of in my office that can't, no one's going to be able to crack into that right from out there in the online world. So am I okay there? Yeah. And writing it down the old fashioned way, like keeping a password journal. Absolutely. I, I know a couple of people do that. A, a certain family member of mine does actually maintain a password journal 
and they just they have a safe and they just store it with the safe with their their birth certificates and their passports and their other critical documents. So it, it's not about do you write it down or do you not write it down. It's where do you keep it when you write it down, right? Making sure that that that's kept in a in a secure place. Bingo, that makes sense, Daniel. Let's talk about multi-factor authentication. It's something that's been gaining popularity, uh, but there's also some talk that you know, multi-factor authentication or MFA is not a secure way to keep online accounts and data safe. So myth number three, MFA is not secure and should be avoided. Your thoughts? Absolutely not true. <laughs> MFA is a absolutely critical control and businesses have been rolling it out a lot, but I encourage you in your personal life and, and as consumers to also try to use MFA as many places as you can. This myth is a, a bit of a, a complex one because it really originates from a particular type of MFA, which we call SMS-based multi-factor authentication, which is essentially that little uh, six to eight digit code that gets sent to you in a text message. And that is not safe um, because there is a, a couple different attacks so that um, sophisticated threat actors can reroute those messages to their phone. There's a couple of different attacks. The most common one is a, a SIM swapping attack. So if you implement MFA properly, though, it, it's such an important security measure. It will protect you so many times. Uh, you hear about these, these data breaches and these password leaks uh, all the time. And, and a shout out to the haveibeenpwned.com where you can look and see where your credentials may have been exposed. But you're really, you're really reducing the risk of those password exposures when you have MFA because that second factor is not available to them. If you only have the ability to use an SMS-based multi-factor authentication, use it. You're better off using nothing or something rather than nothing. But in a lot of cases, Google and Microsoft have authenticator apps, these soft token applications that provide um, security that's really, really difficult to beat. Uh, and going back to actually to our previous one, they'll give you the ability to have recovery codes. So talking about your password journal again, Adrian, go ahead and put those recovery codes in there because if your phone ever dies, then it makes it really hard to get back into those accounts. All right, let's switch gears now. Let's talk about antivirus. And you know, I remember a little while ago, an executive at an antivirus company came out and said that, AV, antivirus, is dead. Now, people in organizations, they're all over the world. They're still using AV today. So is it true that it's dead? And that leads us to myth number four. You don't need AV. Speak to that, please. Yeah, this is a little bit more marketing than reality. I would say that traditional antivirus is probably not as effective as it used to be. Uh, what we see is it's being replaced by more um, sophisticated methods of detection and response. But in general, AV is not really going anywhere yet. It, it's more kind of embedded into these other products and solutions, kind of been a bit of a standard. In fact, most of your modern operating systems, including Windows and Mac, come with some kind of AV solution already built in. Now, for, for your organizations, definitely want to be managing that and, and probably going a step farther and finding a uh, an EDR uh, solution, endpoint detection and response, which goes a little bit beyond AV and looks for different tactics and techniques that are, are used with traditional tools that are built into operating systems and environments so that you can detect attacks that use uh, living off the land techniques. All right. Myth number five, Daniel, uh, let's talk about virtual private networks, VPNs. A lot of VPNs uh, that are geared toward consumers make it seem like if you turn it on, then your device is protected. Is that truly the case? So here's myth number five. A VPN can keep my devices safe and secure. So VPN is a really great technology. The, there's a bit of a challenge here, though, is we have a lot of these consumer-focused VPN technologies really going after users and trying to convince them that a VPN will somehow prevent their computer from getting malware and protect them. What those uh, VPN systems really do is protect your data in transit when you're uh, at a coffee shop or at a hotel. And in a lot of cases, most websites now use modern uh, encryption that would protect you from 
a lot, but not all of, of the issues that would kind of plague you when you're using a shared Wi-Fi space. So, uh, no, VPN does not protect you from getting malware on your system. For corporations and enterprise, what VPN does is help protect uh, remote communications when your users are work from home, as who we all are these days, and trying to access internal resources and making sure that connection's secure and making sure, most importantly, that the way that the users come in and authenticate and, and kind of authorize their ac actions and activities is through a, a centralized location. So you should definitely not be using RDP as an, an enterprise to allow users to access internal resources. You really need that VPN. But for you consumers out there, most of the time you really don't need this. It doesn't hurt by any means. It's definitely a nice add-on, but you still want something like an antivirus like we were just talking about to really protect you from malware. Okay, uh, we are wrapping things up with our myth buster today, Daniel Spicer. All right, Daniel, one more myth that we're going to bust today is that cybersecurity is the sole responsibility of a company's IT department. So myth number six, IT is responsible for all of the cybersecurity at an organization. Absolutely not. There's there's only so much that your security team can do to keep you, you and your organization safe and secure. Uh, we, we can implement controls and advise people on the best thing, but you know we, we talk about it all the time. The, the number one weakness in the chain at the end of the day is a user. And that's why uh, we pour so much time and effort into to training and outreach of users and you know hope that those messages don't end up in, in spam or deleted on bread because it, it really is critical for users to have a healthy layer of, of skepticism when they're receiving an email asking them for their password or when someone calls and asks them to make a, a wire transfer outside of the normal procedure. So it, it really is important that security kind of starts at, at the user layer. And we talk a lot about having a culture of security and organization. So I, I think it's critical that we talk about that. But you'll also notice that there's a lot more shifting of security functions into IT, right? Uh, when we talk about vulnerability management and patch management, when we talk about validating users, when they ask for password resets, these are all places where the IT organization is deeply involved in security. And, and quite frankly, without an IT organization, who pays attention to security, security programs will fail because we rely on them to help us implement our controls and, and maintain those processes. All right, Daniel. Well, listen, we appreciate you serving as our myth buster today and doing it solo without, without the assistance of our other security expert, Mr. Chris Gettle, who's normally on Avanti Insights. And Daniel, before I let you go, as you're aware, but we're going to make everyone else aware, this is my last Avanti Insights Broadcast. So I'm going to be leaving Avanti here later this month in December, moving on to another company. But Avanti Insights, folks, will continue in 2022 with Daniel, with Chris, and whoever that else they can find to fill my seat. So you'll still get the same insights. So keep tuning in. And Daniel, just want to wish you and Chris in abstentia happy holidays. Thanks, Adrian. Take care of yourself. All right. And happy holidays, everyone. Chris and Daniel will see you on the other side in 2022 with Avanti Insights. And remember, during the holiday season especially, stay safe, be secure, and keep smiling. smiling.